when Thomas Stamford Bingley Raffles first stepped ashore in Singapore in 1819, the odds are that it would have been in a foot or two of mud here at the mouth of the Singapore River. And to make matters worse for the poor chap, he was probably stepping over bleached bones and decomposing bodies. Local pirates regularly dumped the bodies of their victims hereabouts, so I guess there probably would have been a pretty nasty stench as well. But let's take a few steps further forward, 184 years into the present, to the spot where, according to legend, our intrepid colonial founder first stepped ashore. And here is a statue of the gentleman in question, which gives this site a certain degree of legitimacy. But was it really here? It could have been 50 metres that way, or 30 metres that way. He rather looks as if he's trying to remember where exactly it was himself. Inevitably, the passage of time blurs our memories of where precisely events happened, even what building stood here. So rapidly has Singapore evolved. Everywhere, we're surrounded by a long, rich and vibrant history that now we can see little evidence of. But over the coming weeks, we're going to open up a window into the past. You're probably wondering by now just who on earth I am. My name is Julian Davison, and here's a super to prove it. I'm a writer of sorts, and I write mainly about Southeast Asia. And the sights and sounds of Singapore have been part of my family history for four generations. As it happens, my great-grandfather probably stepped ashore for the very first time just about here. That was in 1880 or thereabouts, most likely onto Johnston's Pier which in those days jutted out some 50 metres from the shore, right opposite the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank building on the corner of Collier Quay and Battery Road. He decided he quite liked the look of the place, and so he stayed. No doubt memories of a cold, grey, dismal, wet, wintry Wales, my great-grandfather was a Welshman, helped to make his mind up for him. But there may have been another factor at work here, there is a family story that my great-grandfather actually lived on a boat in the middle of Singapore Harbour with a woman who was not my great-grandmother. A Javanese lady, it is said. More than this, I know not, but it's a good story and one that I'd like to believe in. Anyway, in those days, the sea wall would have been about five metres from where I am walking. Somewhere about over there. But I'm leaping 60 years ahead of the plot. Let's go back to our hero with the muddy boots in 1819. At the turn of the 19th century, Great Britain's seafaring rival Holland had a stranglehold on the lucrative East Indies spice trade to Europe. Empire building was a splendid adventure for young Stamford Raffles, and he considerably exceeded his brief on behalf of the British East India Company when he decided to establish a trading emporium at Singapore. The Dutch were not impressed and seriously considered sending warships from Java to remove him. Raffles nevertheless stubbornly held on and in doing so changed the destiny of Singapore. It may surprise you to know that Raffles was not actually of aristocratic blood. His family was quite poor and he was obliged to leave school early and start work as a humble clerk in the offices of the East India Company. Raffles got where he did, largely because of self-education and his sheer will to succeed. A role model that is still applicable for Singaporeans today. The first settlement here was probably 1600 years ago. The ancient kingdom of Tomasek briefly flourished, peaking at around the 13th or 14th century AD before declining into obscurity. Sri Tri Buana, an Indian king, then landed here and apparently mistook a large local animal for a lion. So in a moment of inspiration, he christened the island Lion City, Singapore. If he'd bothered to have taken a closer look, he might have recognised the animal as a tiger, which, let's face it, is probably what the creature really was. In that case, he might have named the place Kota Harimau, Tiger City, or whatever the Indian equivalent is. Like most kings, Sri Tri Buana liked his privacy. Once his palace was built on the summit, his subjects were forbidden to set foot on his personal hill. So consequently, it became known as Bukit Larangan, Forbidden Hill. Well, did it get its name because it was haunted? After all, the old Malay kings lie buried here. 
or so Raffles thought. The wooden palisades that once ringed the base of Bukit Larangan had long vanished by the time of Raffles' arrival, but there did remain one single and enduring archaeological treasure. I, I rather imagine this might have been something like what they found at the mouth of the Singapore River. A large monolith split in two, measuring about 10 foot square, with an inscription on one of the inner surfaces. A priceless clue to Singapore's ancient past. The Brits can be a trifle thoughtless at times, and this is one of the occasions when they rarely exceeded themselves. Someone decided that it was big, it was in the way, and it should be gotten rid of. It was blown to pieces. One of those pieces is in the care of the Singapore History Museum, but it's only one of thousands. Whatever secrets the monolith might have held are gone forever. And gone forever too is the exact site where Raffles built his first house. But I think I'm very close to it. Up there is the highest point on Bukit Larangan, renamed Government Hill by the British, today's Fort Canning. And that's where Raffles decided to build a house for himself. Unfortunately, in 1859, the British lopped the top off it and built a gun emplacement there. Later still, they built a reservoir there. It's covered over in case you're wondering where the water went to. So, in actual fact, Raffles House probably stood about 10 to 15 metres above the centre of today's reservoir. The original site has literally vanished into thin air. Let's shift the site 200 metres northeast and peg out its floor plan. Singapore's first government house was single storey, had rough plank walls and an atap roof, but was of generous size. Measuring 100 feet long by 50 feet wide, it would have been most impressive. I think we can safely assume no one's at home. When Raffles arrived, he shared the island with around 500 inhabitants of Malay origin and less than 100 of Chinese descent. It's the only time in Singapore's history when the British nearly outnumbered the Chinese, but all that would soon change. And so too with the British breakfast change. The Brits in the old days never trusted the local water wherever they went, quite rightly so. So it was wine or beer for breakfast, and no doubt that would have put Sir Stamford in a happier frame of mind for another day of empire building. Cheers. Although this may not look like a time machine, I'm actually being transported back into the past to the Tanglin Shopping Center. I'll be back. It's my belief that Antiques of the Orient has the most spectacular private collection of old maps, prints, etchings and engravings in Singapore. And it's owned by a good friend of mine, Julie Yeo. Well, um, I've just been on the top of Fort Canning having a look around for the remains of uh, Raffles House. That's Fort Canning in the foreground, right, uh, yeah. yes, okay, with, um, with the flagstaff. Flag and that's Raffles House up there. Right. And that's the first Protestant church, again with a view of Fort Canning mm. and from, Raffles. From the Padang? Yes, looking up towards Fort Canning. It's fortunate for Singapore that so many talented artists found the developing settlement such a source of inspiration. They creatively substituted for photography when the process was still in its infancy. This is the first reclamation job in the early days where soil from Mount Wallach was used to reclaim Tolok Air Basin. When would that have been? In the uh, mid-19th century. I'm sure one always thinks of uh, land reclamation as something of modern Singapore. That's right. We've had a look at Raffles' landing place, and we've been to his house. Now we're off to visit his mistress. Singaporeans love a good mystery or legend. As a consequence, many were happy to believe that the grave of Sir Stamford Raffles' Chinese mistress is located here, alongside busy Stevens Road. It's a site regularly visited by curious tourists and locals. So what do you make of this uh, Raffles mistress story, I think it, it only came up uh, rather recently, didn't it? Really? We're not saying that Sir Stamford Raffles definitely had no Chinese mistress. What we are saying is that the person buried here is unlikely to have been her. OK, well, here we are. Yeah. You, see, you were saying that uh, every year the family comes to... to come 
Qingming time, they will come, they will clean the grave, and then they will paint it. Family descendants of this mysterious woman maintain that her record of birth is incorrect and should be 10 or so years earlier, but this has yet to be proven. So anyway, I mean, as far as people's concerned, uh, it couldn't possibly be Raffles' mistress. I don't think the it can be. The dates just don't tally. Yeah, the dates don't tally at all. Uh, it's a nice story, but there again, okay, so it might not have been Raffles who It could be mistress, somebody yeah. later on, a later governor, you know, yeah. a later governor. So I think, Julie, that's one story about Raffles will have to declare absolute rubbish. Absolutely. For those who prefer facts rather than fiction, a visit to the National Archives would be recommended. It contains, amongst other things, over a million and a half photographs, 130,000 maps and building plans, 10,000 hours of audio interviews, and countless kilometers of videotape. Images and memories of a nation that constitute treasure beyond price. Hi, hello. hello. Good afternoon, Chi. Hey. Yeah. I wonder if you can help me. I spent practically every Saturday morning for the past three years in this fascinating place. And if I spend another three years of Saturday mornings, I'll still only be scratching the surface. Hmm, this looks interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, these are clearly very old indeed. Though the first photographs of the fledgling settlement were taken in the early 1840s, it wasn't until the 1860s and beyond that a varied and comprehensive photographic record became available. Beginning with Port Canning in the distance, this panoramic photograph of the river is a superb example of what Singapore looked like about 130 years ago. To the north, the only familiar landmark is the spire of St Andrew's Cathedral. Alongside St Andrew's Cathedral is the Padang. Originally called simply the Plain, it was Stamford Raffles himself who in 1822 designated this area as Singapore's first green space. And surprisingly, it still survives. The original buildings alongside it, however, have not. The architect responsible for a number of these impressive bungalows was Irishman George Drumgool Coleman, appointed Director of Public Works in 1833. The Supreme Court and the City Hall now stand where his bungalows once stood. And long gone too is Coleman's original St Andrew's Cathedral. It was rebuilt in 1860, surviving to become a Singapore icon. And inside, a central stained glass window commemorates the original Singapore icon, Sir Stamford Raffles, benign colonial godfather and midwife to modern Singapore's birth. In the mid-19th century, Britain found itself with a great many idle Indian convicts on its hands, so often put them to work on the construction of public buildings. On the north bank at the mouth of the Singapore River, one such effort is still with us. Oh, now that looks familiar. Mm -hmm. These are actually the government offices that were actually built after St. Jews. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? They're still there, but you might not recognize them. Over a 50-year period, it was added to, subtracted from, restored, revamped, refurbished, and generally redeveloped almost beyond recognition. With more facelifts than Michael Jackson, it has recently reopened as the new wing of the Asian Civilization Museum. We know it as Empress Place, but that's a name that came about more by accident than design. In 1907, it was the public square in front of the building that was named Empress Place in honor of the late Queen Victoria. It was a catchy name, certainly a lot more exciting than the government offices. And in time, the name of the place became that of the building itself. And right behind Empress Place, the biggest surprise of all, Maxwell House, designed by George Coleman in 1827. How did such a magnificent building apparently vanish into thin air? No colonial conjuring trick, actually, for in a sense it's still there they'd seen rather more changes than poor old Empress Place. And no prizes for recognizing what it became. Old Parliament House is a familiar image, but is there anything at all left of Maxwell House? I think you'll find some of it still in there, Julian. It's a bit like a, a quay lapis with layers on top of it, but it's down there at the bottom. Oh, that sounds tasty. <laughs> um, perhaps you care to lead the way, Wayne? Yeah, come. So um, this would have been the main entrance to the Houses of Parliament. Yes. 
But of Maxwell's original house, where would that have started? Where would the external wall be? The external wall would be over the side, at this edge of the wall. <laughs> right. And, and the 1879 edition pushed it out to here? Yes, correct. Okay. And this would have been an original opening in the design by George Coleman? Yes, the original opening. We are retaining that as well. Okay. Now, I understand that Maxwell's house had a number of uh, uses during its long life. Yes, well, of course, Maxwell wasn't allowed to occupy the house, or generously decided not to occupy the house, because he wasn't supposed to live here. It was civic ground, so he rather generously leased it back to the colonial authority. And it served as a kind of town hall and originally the courthouse. Right. And um, this uh, brickwork over here, this looks interesting. Um, would this have been part of the original brickwork? Yes, this date as far back as the 19th century. Old Parliament House, when renovations have been completed, will become a performing and visual art centre, an evolution that its original architect would surely have approved of. So this room that we see here, which is a magnificent, and I can see the hand of uh, Coleman at work, this would have been one of the main reception rooms of Maxwell's original house. I think it would have been. This part over here would probably have been a, like a screen and you could have walked through. I would think so. You know, we, we, we've got lots of old pictures of the outside and some elevation drawings, but we've never really come across yeah. the original plans. Right. I imagine then in this case, this would have been the, uh, the principal reception room, is, is that yeah. right? And again, that would have been open with a view overlooking the Padang. Yeah. Or what was it called, the parade ground or something like that? I'm sure it was. <laughs> For a man who contributed so much to early Singaporean architecture, surprisingly few images of George Coleman himself exist. But here's an interesting one. On a surveying expedition, he and his party met a large and unwelcome guest that fortunately chose not to eat the eminent architect. He survived and continued his work. I'm just on my way to pay a visit to one of his loveliest creations, down St Andrews Road. It's not there now, but I think you'll recognize the site. Whereas Coleman didn't build the original Raffles Institution, he significantly improved upon what was becoming a shabby and crumbling structure. A generation has grown up with only the memory of this impressive landmark from their childhood, Raffles City. But I have a different and distant memory of when the site was home to an architectural gem called the Raffles Institution an elite school for promising youngsters, Senior Minister Lee Kuan Yew and Prime Minister Go Chok Tong were both Raffles Institution old boys. I distinctly remember walking down Brass Bassa Road with my father, more years ago than I care to admit, and turning into a long, dark corridor. I was five years old and quite unimpressed. As you can see, behind me was Raffles Hotel. It was a hot day and what I really wanted was an ice cream. I can't quite recall whether my father ever bought me that ice cream or not, but 35 years down the track, I can at least have a gelato. Ah, splendid, just what I needed. An excellent Italian restaurant, Prego's, now occupies the corner of the original site. The Raffles Institution was demolished in the 1960s and made way for Raffles City, so at least the name lives on. But what of the gentleman himself? Sir Thomas Stamford Bingley Raffles left Singapore in 1823, never to return. His wish to be buried alongside the Malay kings of legend on Fort Canning Hill was unfulfilled. He died in England three years later, and his mortal remains reside unromantically in the Hendon Cemetery right next to a bleak and busy motorway. Even after his death, Raffles continued to move around quite a bit. You see behind me, right in the middle of the Padang, the site of his first statue, cast in bronze, which was placed there in 1887. Apparently, at its unveiling, two Malay gentlemen were overheard to exclaim enthusiastically, Ayya! Orang Hitam, Sama Sama Kita, which roughly translates as, goodness, he's a black man like ourselves. It's a story I quite like to believe. He was moved in 1919, and I have my own theory why this might be so. Too darn close to the cricket club. He 
was moved to a position in front of the Victoria Memorial Theatre and Concert Hall, where he remained until 1942. But 30,000 Japanese soldiers arrived, quite unexpectedly, and took objection to him. His destruction was actively urged, but cooler heads prevailed. He spent the occupation years gathering dust in a back room of the Singapore History Museum, patiently awaiting liberation. In 1946, Raffles was dusted off and placed back in front of the Victoria Memorial Theatre and Concert Hall. And 40 years later, his Caucasian twin was successfully cloned in white marble. Standing by his possible point of arrival on the Singapore River, he provides an iconic backdrop for tourist photos and a resting place for weary pigeons. Here on Sentosa, victors and vanquished are caught frozen in time as the Japanese sit down to sign the surrender papers. The war in the Pacific was over. But Britain had paid a high price for being on the winning side in the Second World War. The nation was physically exhausted and it was bankrupt too. Moreover, the winds of change were blowing vigorously throughout its entire colonial empire. They might have won the war, but a great deal of face had been lost. Certainly there's not too many happy faces here, are there? Within two decades, the last of the British had followed Raffles home. After their 150-year visit, they are today fondly remembered for their splendid buildings, their baked beans, and their soccer teams. Love them or hate them, the British left an indelible mark on the face of Singapore. I'd like to conclude this first programme with a remark from the middle of the last century when it was obviously time for them to go. I feel it perfectly captures local sentiment at that time. If one must have a master, then the British are by far the best. But the question that must be asked is, why have a master at all? Ah, outstanding. In next week's program, for every race a separate place, Julian cooks curry in a hurry. Like old Parliament House, Kampong Glam Istana's about to take on a new role too, and the whole site's beginning to look pretty spectacular. And Julian's off to visit Wampo's legendary garden in the hope of a dinner invitation. But he may be 160 years too late. Before I leave you, take a long hard look at this site. Look familiar? The first 10 callers to ring in and correctly identify where it is and what was so recently there will each receive a copy of Gretchen Liu's excellent pictorial history of Singapore. For those of you not quite so fast off the mark, the next 10 callers, I'm afraid you'll only win yourselves a copy of my rather more modest offering, One for the Road. I do, however, promise to write a personal dedication in each and every one which will turn your friends green with envy. Good luck and goodbye until next week. Why can't I say the Malay? It's not there now, but the site's still there. I can't remember what the hell was it. It was the light. It's not there, but I think you'll recognize the site, yeah. Recognize the site, yeah.